Welcome everybody to um, our History at Newcastle Research Seminar for this week, which happily coincides with New South Wales History Week. Uh, the theme of which is uh, Neighbours, which um, I'm sure that Tamsin will explain the uh, Scott and Charlene slide in context for you. Um, so we're very lucky to have one of our academic neighbours presenting today, Tamsin O'Connor, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney, working on a thesis about the New South Wales penal stations. Um, and her presentation today fits within that, <coughs> that bigger project. Yes, indeed. In fact, it's, it's, it's the uh, second chapter of my thesis. Second chapter of the thesis. Well, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the presentation is entitled Bad Neighbours, the Smugglers and Pirates of the Penal Station and Port of Newcastle, 1804 to 1824. And we'll follow the normal format, so Tamsin will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay, so thank you, Tamsin. Thank you, Kate. At first, I was a little thrown by the History Week theme of neighbours. Like everyone, I hard, find it hard not to think of Ramsey Street. But I guess before we can meet the aspirations of the great Australian suburb, we must first reckon with the shock troops of settlement, the penal station convicts. Neighbours is not a word that I commonly use in the context of penal station history, but I am interested in communities, mentalities and subcultures. And what, after all, were those who lived in close proximity in barracks or huts, but neighbours, good and bad. In one real sense, the whole settlement was a very bad neighbour to the Wabakal and Waramai, and I would like to acknowledge that in spite of the devastating impact of colonial dispossession, they remain the traditional owners and custodians of these lands. But today, I will not be exploring that history. Instead, I will begin by examining the imaginative context of the penal station of Newcastle, the neighbourhood, if you will, the physical and mental landscape that create a unique maritime culture of piracy and smuggling. I suspect, in any case, most of you are here for the pirates, not the neighbours. Everyone loves a pirate. But I must warn you that Australian pirates did not resemble this. <laughs> or even this, my particular favourite. The smugglers and pirates of Newcastle made bad neighbours because they broke the body corporate rules, thus depriving government of the peaceful enjoyment of its new colonial property and the full benefit of its resources and revenue. But as we shall see, they could be rather good neighbours to each other, forming cooperative networks, alliances and communities. So without further ado, I will set the scene for my story of smugglers and pirates, neighbours good and bad. In the first of his 1998 Boyer lectures, David Maloof suggested, if the Aborigines are a land-dreaming people, what we latecomers share is a sea-dreaming, to which the idea of Australia as an island has always been central, a beautiful and striking image. Yet for those of us brought up on the Australian legend, it lacks immediate resonance. Well, for their part, many indigenous Australians, including the Awabakal and Waramai, would doubtless be surprised that their ancient coastal and seagoing histories were so easily dismissed. Of course, Maloof's cultural concerns here are principally European, and for all its troubling conceptual flaws, there is a certain prescience in his notion of the sea dream, anticipating as it does the cultural and historiographical shifts to come. As I write, I am reminded of two Australian paintings. The first is a familiar favourite, with its white bark guns, dusty brown grass, grass, an endless blue sky, and the mateship of the muster. It is Tom Roberts's The Breakaway, it is 1891, and it is unmistakably Australian. The second is far less familiar, and its dark tones tell of solitude and seal kills. It is 1824, and the young voyager and his dog are perched on the rocky edges of an undistinctive shore. It is in fact the North Atlantic island of Tristan de Cunha, a remote and occasional port of call for ships en route to Australia. These two paintings, divided by time and space, represent utterly different aesthetic, imaginative and economic worlds yet they are both part of the same colonial journey. Nevertheless, it is still the pastoral breakaway, not the oceanic solitude that strikes a cultural chord, for it summons that ever so authentically Australian landscape of the 1890s 
when the nationalist movement found its voice in the bulletin and its identity in the bush. And it is this landlocked representation of our country's past that has sustained successive generations of Australians. In contrast, the culture of the sea, as distinct from that of the beach, has not loomed large in the nation's sense of self. As Frank Breeze wrote also in 1998, the romantic heroization of pastoral workers and farmers has found no counterpart in the port. Seamen and wharfies were beyond social tolerance, an attitude no doubt sharply reinforced by the maritime strike of 1890. To which he could also now add the bitter waterside dispute of 1998. In Australia, maritime concerns have often seemed but a prologue to the defining moment that revealed the endless territory beyond the Great Dividing Ranges. Nothing could divert our gaze from an extraordinary landscape where the national story was written and the national character was shaped, or so we have always been told. As the awkward urban protagonist of Kate Grenville's The Idea of Perfection ruefully observes of his uncomfortable rural predicament. The message had come through loud and clear at school, an Australian was a man on the back of a horse, rounding up sheep or cracking a whip. Yet as D.R. Hainsworth points out, in the history of New South Wales, there have always been two frontiers, the interior and the ocean. Moreover, the history of so many Australian families, like that of the nation itself, is the tale of successive ocean voyages. How quickly we forget our sea dream. The bush legend has been much explored, and at its heart, we invariably find the convict, the old lag, or the bush ranger, the spiritual ancestors of Tom Roberts's dynamic horsemen. This paper aims to re-examine not the myth, but the context of its human sources, their physical and mental <coughs> geographies. For as Geoffrey Blaney reminded us so long ago, most convict ploughmen and herdsmen worked within a day's walk of the sea, and many worked and lived closer still in the few limpid ports that clung to the long, lonely coastline. Whereas Dorothy Scheinberg observed, the colonists felt themselves perched on the Pacific seaboard rather than at the edge of a great continent. Indeed, the first four governors of New South Wales were naval men presiding over a settlement that surged with ocean workers and with convicts who had been socially shipwrecked at the ends of the earth. Augustus Earle's now unfamiliar figure of the sealer, the castaway, the transnational European, adrift on the vast oceans, was instantly and vividly recognisable to the men and women of early New South Wales, who were neither ready nor able to turn their backs to the sea. The all-pervasive the all pervasive influence of water, sea, harbour and river, as Grace Carskins reminds us in relation to Sydney's rocks, was both replicated and intensified at the penal station of Newcastle. Indeed, most colonial representations, and there's the iconic one, of the settlement favour a seaward perspective. The artist's eye invariably gazes over the settlement and out to sea. A perspective that is blindingly obvious to you as Novocastrians, but it is one that is often lost in the wider historiography. At the penal station, the tides and currents dictated the very nature and rhythm of the working day. Miners, lime burners and sawyers were as conscious of the water as the boat crews and the unlucky men detailed to build the breakwater. Salt water seeped through their slops into every saw as they hauled themselves, their chains and their heavy loads through the waters of the harbour and river to all the unbearable settlement of the temptation, to the unbearable temptation of the settlement boats. The tradesmen in the superintendent's yard fashioned the wood, nail and copper that kept those precious boats afloat. And the commandants badgered Sydney for the skilled labour to build more. For all that, the men quickly found ways of making the rhythm of the waters work for them. In January 1811, the commandant, Lieutenant John Purcell, complained, my line burners will only work as they see the Nelson perform voyages. Indeed, the comings and goings of the vessels of the coastal fleet were closely monitored by everyone on the settlement. After all, it was the only official line of communication with Sydney. A number of privately owned, licensed vessels belonging to traders such as Underwood, Thompson and Raby visited the settlement each month to collect consignments of coal and timber. And at least one larger government vessel was kept in constant motion between Sydney and Newcastle. 
That the convicts were to be allowed to write as often as they pleased to their friends in Sydney or elsewhere was enshrined in the Commandant's orders in 1810. They were also to be allowed to receive the necessaries and comforts of life from their friends in Sydney, spirits excepted. No wonder then that the little ships were the focus for the hopes, fears and ambitions of every man and woman on the settlement. They carried too the latest exchange in the vast body of official correspondence that regulated the lives of free and bond alike. Although it was the convicts who knew best the truth of Alan Atkinson's assertion that print in black and white had reverberations in flesh and blood. As new drafts of prisoners arrived to a hard life of hard labour and exile, the sense of relative isolation, or perhaps even boredom, of those already on the settlement was momentarily broken, for they brought the latest stories from the rocks and much staler news from London. For the exiled, news of any description was a welcome distraction. In addition, the convicts and the crews carried a heady mix of gossip, conjecture and rumour, which could send the settlement into a murmuring turmoil before the ships had even birthed. Thus, Lieutenant Thomas Scotto was faced with a mass escape when news came of a warship anchored in Sydney Harbour. He reported the whole of the men in this place think that if they can get to Sydney, they will meet a welcome reception on board the sloop of war. No argument can convince them to the contrary. There is some irony in the context of New South Wales. In Dr Johnson's observation that no man will be a sailor who has a contrivance to get himself into a jail, but being in a ship is being in a jail with a chance of being drowned. <laughs> Crucially, the government vessels also brought in the vast bulk of public stores that barely sustained the settlement, and the private necessities and luxuries that did sustain some degree of happiness for the lucky few able to obtain them. They brought wives and families who in turn brought comfort and goods for trade. Above all, they brought in spirits and in exchange took away stolen or unauthorised goods, typically slop clothing, rations, misappropriated timber or even tools. They were two coastal trades and one was blacker than the finest Newcastle coal. Moreover, the proximity of the sea and that fleet of barks, brigs, sloops and schooners held the promise of even greater rewards than sly grog or smothered slops. <laughs> I think it's the same one. Thanks to broadsides, chapbooks, John Gay and Daniel Defoe, the convicts carried 18th century freedom tales across the globe. The Newgate acrobatics of the remarkable Jack Shepherd and the saltier excesses of the notorious Atlantic pirates. But the convicts, these stories of old worlds, new worlds, and times past merged into an enduring culture of excarceration and resistance. Although, as Ian Duffield points out, it is almost impossible to establish a direct causal link between British popular culture and particular moments of Australian convict agency. However, it is reasonable to argue, as I have done elsewhere, that the history of early Newcastle is not predicated on crime or even coal, but on the pursuit of freedom and the corresponding efforts to curtail it. The most dramatic expression of this refusal to be contained, either legally or physically, is a long, though somewhat unsuccessful, history of piracy and mutiny. In September 1970, 1797, when Lieutenant John Shortland discovered the richly seamed cliffs of the harbour and the heavily forested reaches of a promising river, it was purely serendipitous. But as the comparative roughness of his eye sketch indicates, this was no survey party. He was in pursuit of convict pirates and their government prize, the Cumberland. The promise of coal and cedar must have offered some consolation for Shortland's failure to recapture the ship. However, the systematic exploitation of these literary resources did not get seriously underway until March 1804, when Newcastle was designated and established as a place of further punishment. How idyllic it looks. Accordingly, 33 convicts were dispatched under the command of a very young Lieutenant Charles Menzies, supported by a surgeon, a storekeeper, a superintendent, an artist, a botanist, and more usefully in the circumstances, a sergeant and nine privates. It was, of course, King's frantic attempt to silence the freedom cries of the mutinous Irish. Then, in May, he sent 21 newly arrived English prisoners 
of the Coromandel straight to Newcastle. They were not under sentence. None of the best, he explained. But by mixing the Englishman with the Irish, he told Menzies, I promise myself less evil will arise. <laughs> he was to be disappointed, for the convicts first responded by plotting together to kill the military and take the settlement, and then they formed two distinct groups with two distinct plans. King greeted the news of the attempted uprising with implacable exasperation, assuring a very shaken Menzies that we have little to expect and to be constantly harassed by the screams, the schemes of those who it is our duty to guard. Two of the worst ringleaders, he continued, are to be sent to headquarters for trial in separate vessels, double irons and handcuffs. This was after they had received between 200 and 500 lashes. Without trial. These transfer precautions were indicative of more than an urge to merely punish, for the coastal vessels were always vulnerable to the ambitions of the convicts and the unpredictability of their crews, who were often just as willing and far better placed to test the limits of authority. The coastal vessels, their trade routes and the harbours where they berthed were all contested spaces. A host of court regulations were adapted over time, to restrict the movement of the vessels and their cargoes and crew, and less under strict supervision. David Day has observed, the regulations designed to prevent the escape of convicts from the colony also bore heavily upon the movement of three persons. They were meant to. King's instructions to Menzies could not have been plainer. If any vessel comes to the river without my license, you will confine her crew and scuttle the vessel. For attached to fears of convict piracy were fears of crew complicity. However, a government license did not guarantee the loyalty of the crew or the master. It was no doubt with this in mind that Joseph Myfield, John Baker, James Carman, John Pierce, and Thomas Coyne seized the line burner's boat and pulled alongside the resource in September 1811. Neither the nature nor the extent of their negotiations is recorded, but we do know that they got no farther than the triangles, where they each received a surprisingly modest and oddly precise 43 lashes. It was a familiar outcome for the former soldier Thomas Coyne, who had made many such attempts at both Newcastle and Port Jackson. And this really was part of the problem. Unless the authorities resorted to mass executions in response to escape attempts from Port Jackson, for which they had neither the stomach nor the legal sanction, then their only recourse was further exile to, among other places, Newcastle, where, as it turned out, the conditions for making further attempts were more or less ideal. Thus, in early October 1810, Purcell's already considerable problems were increased by the arrival of five of the men who had attempted to seize the American brig Aurora. And by the 23rd of October, we learn they have played all manner of tricks to get off. Interestingly, a soldier named Samuel Elliott of the 73rd was also implicated in the attempt and he was sent to the settlement not as a convict under court-martial, but merely to join the detachment there. This, it seems, was deemed punishment enough. For almost 20 years, successive commandants would struggle to impose their authority over the traffic of the port. To be sure, the port and said settlement regulations are testament to the rigour and reach of government power. But they, the frequency with which they were posted, with all manner of adaptations, reveals the extent to which that power was being tested. Every positive order was in fact a response to the convict's latest attempt to skirt the boundaries of obedience and disobedience. We may glimpse a plethora of long-forgotten tales of evasion, defiance and escape behind Morissette's constant insistence that no ship enter the harbour under cover of darkness, and behind Wallace's attempt to close the territory around the lighthouse and signal post and behind every commandant's anxious orders to muster the men. A host of regulations concerning the supervision of the settlement boats, and above all the security of their oars and sails, reveals a long history of stolen chances and carefully hatched plans. For even the tightest of the regulations to be effective, they must be enforced. But a sense of duty was not always a match for the waterside negotiations and combinations of the sailors, soldiers and convicts who all looked to the sea for their salvation. In August 1819, John Russell was punished with 75 lashes for secreting three oars and conspiring with two soldiers in cutting out a boat. 
John Garstead received 50 lashes for being a constable on duty, knowing the same and not attempting to stop it. What happened to the two soldiers, I have been unable to ascertain. Newcastle perfectly demonstrates the locational and functional incompatibility of its competing moral geographies. On one hand, we have an institution of constraint driven by penal, naval, and military discipline. And on the other, we have all the familiar freedoms, dysfunction, and disorder of the court. Accordingly, the abstract intention of penal space at Newcastle can be reimagined as one overlaid with a range of unsanctioned new meanings invested by the convicts, soldiers, and sailors, and shaped by their diverse and often oppositional interests. On occasion, the record reveals that the soldiers did more than turn a blind eye. Some, like Samuel Elliott and Thomas Coyne, crossed the Rubicon and the regimental line to join the convicts. For they too were unwilling transportees of sorts, constrained, isolated, and exiled. And as Purcell observed, this place is as nearly disagreeable to one as to the other. The soldiers had limited scope at Newcastle to enjoy their nominal freedom or their wages, not least because, as Miles Ogborn shows, the Army and Navy developed an early expertise in the techniques and spatial practices of discipline. They infiltrated the social lives of their employees more deeply than did virtually any other 19th century employer, a predicament the convicts would have easily understood. Mm. Nevertheless, the very techniques that in many ways unified the convicts' and military experience could also divide it. Thus, the complementary forces of regimental discipline and brotherhood and the material benefits of rum and wages usually discouraged overt gestures of commonality. As the Lion Burners gang would find their cost on the 14th of May, 1814, when they attempted to seize the boat and one of their number was seriously wounded when the military instantly retaliated by opening fire. The seamen were always a much likelier prospect. They needed to cultivate reciprocal relationships with the convicts to enjoy the benefits of the black market. And they did not carry muskets. In 1810, in one of Commandant Purcell's long and rambling letters, he complained, the, Lady N the sailors of the Lady Nelson are very bad. Their officers not only take no lead, but encourage them. It seems Brian Egan, her emancipist master, was in the habit of losing convicts on the way to Newcastle. On this occasion, it was the famous absconders, Ratty, Tobin, and Hogg. Egan is very much to blame, insisted Purcell, being in the habit of taking off irons from the men. And naturally, those who could seized such opportunities to jump ship. Thus, in March 1811, Saeed, a Moor, effected his escape at Broken Bay by swimming. And of course, Broken Bay is the start of a horse spring. We hear nothing further of his fate, but we can only hope that he made it to the settlement. I recently discovered the excellent genealogical resource, Free Settler or Felon, where I learned that the notorious Newcastle bolter, John Fitzgerald, was remembered in the Sydney Gazette as the finest sea diver in two colonies. I cannot help but wonder whether he had acquired this unusual and specialised skill for an Irishman in similar circumstances, diving for the Hawkesbury. The rare appearance of a large ocean-going vessel and crew in Newcastle sparked all manner of ambitious and piratical plots. Throughout November 1816, Commandant Wallace reported anxiously that the presence of the Brig Nautilus of Calcutta was creating much speculation amongst some of the prisoners. In fact, it would bring the settlement to a virtual standstill and the Commandant to the end of his frail endeavour. For a week later, we learned that Wallace has had frequent information of plots between the prisoners and crew to get off I found the first attempt by the sentry firing on the men endeavouring to carry off the pilot boat. From the loss of the trial and the reported capture of the kangaroo, together with the encouragement received by prisoners from some persons on board the Nautilus, I never had a more uneasy time, <clears throat> and my men, from constant duty, are much harassed. On the face of it, it was a good month for pirates in New South Wales. The small crews of the private vessels were generally comprised of convicts and emancipated and even the free seamen, though many would have been lascars of the Brig Nautilus, did not represent a distinct category. Again, the legal boundaries were blurred by shared experience. And perhaps this is why the sailors of the Hunter informed the Commandant that they would not permit the convict Thomas Hughes to board their vessel for transfer to Sydney, 
having got some knowledge of his intended profession as an executioner. This could be, have been an act of solidarity with the convicts, or merely an expression of the sailor's superstition towards portents of death. We cannot know. Like the soldiers, sailors understood the rigours of a working life characterised by constant supervision, brutal discipline and close confinement. However, as Peter Leinbau points out, this was a board ship. For in a curious reversal of the convict life, land brought freedom for the sailor in the time-honoured tradition of revels and riots. No one understood this better than the naval authorities. Thus, among the many orders relating to Newcastle, issued in 1804, were instructions that those who have permission to get cedar or coal are by no means to interfere with people at public labour, nor are they to behave troublesome or riotously or to disregard any public order. But they did as sailors always did, and disregarded every order. Five years later, Purcell, the first regimental commandant of Newcastle, took command and tried to take control in shocked tones, he told Macquarie that he had tried to enforce something like morality at this place. Newcastle has been the hell of New South Wales. The way sailors were allowed to go on was worse than the most infamous streets in London or Paris. The transitory presence of the seamen clearly subverted authority and the penal imperative, but they could also present more permanent problems. Among those sentenced to penal stations were a number of sailors, seamen, and seagoing tradesmen. They brought to convict life what Leinbau describes as the large and historic experience of the deep sea proletariat, which was above all characterized by a culture of cooperation and a medley of highly desirable skills. Skills that were put to immediate use by the authorities and more circumspectly by the convicts themselves. As oars, sails, and even boats were stolen or secretly constructed in readiness for the opportunities offered by a ship like the Nautilus. The arrival of the Nautilus ended with the loss of some of Wallace's most trusted, skilled, and therefore relatively indulged men. Though it is interesting how quickly these prized convicts, graced with the finest huts, gardens, and positions of trust, were recast as the most desperate of villains. Patrick Riley, the chief carpenter, and incidentally, the chief candidate for the construction of one of the nation's greatest treasures, Macquarie's collector's chest, and William Evans, the settlement boat builder, and hitherto a favourite of Wallace, were the ringleaders in one of the most daring and meticulously organised plots in the history of Newcastle. Armed with the settlement boat, the finest boat, postal charts, prearranged signals, immaculate timing and navigational skills, they made their escape from the harbour. It should have worked. They played their part with faultless precision and waited at the coast for the Nautilus. She did not come. The captain, Mr. Edwards, who was implicated in the plan, apparently lost his nerve. He delayed sailing, and when he finally weighed anchor, the weather changed, and his ship was wrecked in the treacherous waters of Nobbies, and with it, the hopes of Patrick Riley, William Evans, William Crane, Samuel Colony, Samuel Austin, Thomas Johnston, and Walter White. The entrances of the barred rivers of Australia's east coast are littered with such wrecks. Yet years later at Port Macquarie, such thwarted hopes would bring inspiration of sorts. The constant danger prompted one enterprising young private of the 3rd Regiment of Foot, the Bucks, named William Baines, to sketch his innovative scheme of light boats, rockets launched, lives saved, and he had hoped a grateful government. This wonderful moment of vivid and inventive colour buried deep in the penal station archive was no match for the terse black and white of a memo of rejection from Governor Ralph Darling. As the son of a Kentish lightkeeper, Baines had valuable experience in such matters, but as a young private, he was perhaps beneath the governor's notice. However, it seems a disgraced officer was not. For among those 21 Englishmen sent to Newcastle in May 1804 to dilute the explosive Gaelic mix was Mr. William Douglas, who had been an officer in the Royal Navy. King, with a remarkable faith in the intrinsic powers of social class, told Mentis, I am hopeful he will be of service to you. Give him an opening whereby he may be enabled to recommend himself to your confidence. 
it was, of course, Douglas and past status as a naval officer that prompted the governor's interest. The precise details of his first year at Newcastle are unclear, but two things are certain. He was of no lasting service, and he never took his eyes off the horizon. From September 1805, we learn that Douglas has again been at the head of a party under an idea of running off with one of our boats with an intention of going to Timor, or if possible to get possession of the contest a schooner now in Port Stephens, having run past our harbour some days previous. Again, there were signs of considerable planning. Sails had been stitched out of bed ticking, and an intelligence network was quick to warn the would-be pirates the game was up. Nevertheless, Douglas was arrested, chained, and led to jail. It was his second failure in as many months, and as the constable marched him off, he could not resist one last pathetic dash for the sea and its more lethal certainties. In this, he was thwarted. In April 1819, a former sea captain named John Briggs and a seaman, Thomas Crane, were like Douglas to feel the painful consequences of forming a plan to cut out a vessel. Briggs, however, bided his time, and it came in June 1820, when while serving in the boat crew upriver, he led five men against the overseer, downriver and out to sea. Their hoped-for destination was Botany Bay and a sturdy wee vessel called the Black Jack. I love that. Briggs left a message for Commandant Morissette, which for all its glorious bravado, he would come to regret. Briggs is a desperate villain and desired the coxswain to tell me that as he should soon be a captain of a vessel, he would fire a salute as they passed Newcastle. This would have raised a very appreciative laugh amongst the convicts of the settlement, as Morrissey was famous for his obsessive insistence that the convicts salute his every appearance. However, Briggs's confidence was premature. They never reached the blackjack, and there would be no ironic salutes. Many of these attempts were clearly the product of careful preparation. This implies private spaces with networks of cooperation and lives lived partly beyond the ambit of control. In 1817, Wallace issued the following order. It is a lengthy extract, but it reveals much about the physical and social space of the settlement. The Commandant, having learned with surprise that last night some of the prisoners had the audacity to cut the sails off a boat from the mast in the superintendent's yard, is determined to use every means in his power to discover the perpetrators of so daring a fraud. There were four persons concerned. The Commandant promises pardon and reward to any one of them who will discover their accomplices, or to any other person who will give him information that may lead to a detection. He will be sure in time to discover the perpetrators and make an example of them, which will prevent in future attempts of this kind. He further directs that no person is to quit this settlement except those free by servitude, or gangs to work from daylight to dark. Should any person desert the settlement, the Commandant will hold the owner of the hut responsible and seize it in the name of the Crown. The meanings attached to the successful theft, removal and concealment of those sales was not lost on Wallace. This incident entailed the theft of government property and the promise of escape, which was serious enough, but it also revealed convict's ability to contest the punitive space and to assert their cooperative traditions in face of hierarchical expectations. Hence Wallace's professed surprise and his assertion of the convict's audacity and daring. He responded first by attempting to close convict spaces by increasing the working day, by reducing their mobility and by threatening their huts. Secondly, by encouraging informants, compelling hut owners to police their residences, to dog on their neighbours, he sought to constrain and sever the convict's cooperative relationships. To be sure, while it was true, the commandant usually found someone to make an example of. He never prevented future attempts of this kind. Escape prompted by the push factor of pain and the pull factor of hope, was a thoroughly logical response to the prevailing conditions at Newcastle. But the seizure of boats was more than the seizure of ameliorative opportunities. By taking to the seas, Australian convicts were echoing older solutions to the incursions of empire and the mercantilist state. Piracy potentially allowed men, and the occasional woman, to do more than disappear across oceans, islands and continents. It also, as Alan Atkinson has shown, 
allow them to dream of other ways of living, where no power would attempt to disturb them. Thus, on the night of the 7th of April, 1814, Joseph Burridge, Edward Skirr, Herbert Stiles, and John Pierce took the Speedwell, a schooner, swiftly and silently out to sea, to a life or death among the islands of the Pacific. And that's the sort of vessel they would have been. There were, of course, other less drastic ways of establishing alternative communities and working with your neighbours. But if Newcastle was something of a nest of would-be pirates, then it was also a smuggler's den. generic smugglers don't. A detailed analysis of all the variables and nuances of this trade is beyond the scope of this paper, particularly as much of morning tea is looming. However, a portion of the vibrant pattern of Newcastle smuggling can be traced in its circuitous journey to and from the sea. Journey. Timber, iron, coals and all manner of goods earmarked for exclusive government consumption were liberated for the free market by the application of deft hands, blind eyes, and faulty measures. In 1814, the governor wrote to Commandant Thompson, complaining he seemed oblivious to the fact that the superintendents and overseers continued to carry on illicit traffic for private advantage. Thompson was at a loss, replying, I take every precaution checking the cargo and shall take more. Written exchanges of this sort persisted through the settlement's history, and once more, Official anxieties were expressed in the rapid inflation of orders and regulations designed to reassert government control over its labour and resources. Thus, in 1816, Commandant Wallace took no chances and had sentries posted over the saw pits with their muskets loaded with ball and cartridge. Their task being to ensure that no cedar chips, trimmings or offcuts were lost to the age-old tradition of perquisites of the job. However, it was not just sword timber that was vulnerable to unauthorised movement. Some years earlier, in July 1810, Commandant Purcell reported, The plunder on government here has been incredible. The trouble I have been at to prevent the different traders from robbery would astonish you. He calculated that the government had lost as much as 400 to 500 pounds worth of timber and iron each year. But he ended his report on an optimistic note, seemingly very well satisfied with his new procedures. I defy them at this time to rob government of an inch of cedar or a pound of iron. A regrettable degree of hubris. For quite possibly, even as Purcell was writing, a very large, very valuable log of cedar was buried deep in a cargo of lime and spirited away by the Lady Nelson. The informant on this occasion, though Purcell's tone suggests she was not intending to be helpful, was a woman named Maria Johnson. Maria, it seems, was especially desirable. The commandant had had no less than three applications for her hand, all in the same month. No doubt she made herself attractive and available, for Purcell thought her a most depraved prostitute, a common enough charge in a moral landscape where a plebeian woman's good looks were seen as just another moral failing and where unchastity was invariably confused with criminality. She was certainly fascinating, as he also tells us she's the principal cause of delaying vessels here. He shuddered at the prospect of her matrimony, reflecting that notwithstanding the fact that she was already married, it would be a great pity to have any young man thrown away on her. Her cell, though dimly aware of some scheme, had failed to spot the most appealing of Maria's qualities. She was very useful indeed. The complexity of Maria's relationships was an index to the complexity of the illicit coastal trade. The men who wished to marry her were sailors on rival vessels, and the third was the chief blacksmith and chief trafficker of government goods. Remember all that disappearing government iron. And the man to whom she would in the end give the lion's share of her affection and twelve children was Thomas Crump, one-time Newcastle convict, skilled carpenter, boat builder, and trafficker extraordinaire. Women like Maria may have lacked the inclination or the invitation to piracy, but they established their own forms of mobility, moving easily among the various factions of the settlement. The women carried, exchanged, and received goods, all the while gathering valuable information. At Newcastle, like Sydney Par and Parramatta, living arrangements for those not confined to barracks were organised around hut accommodation, replicating the domestic arrangements and social interactions 
of the households they had left behind in Britain and Ireland. Such a village-like scene conjures a beguiling impression of benign domesticity. But penal space is never neutral. For as Garthine Walker's work on early modern England demonstrates and Kirsty Reed's on Van Diemen's Land, the household was understood as a key component of governance in idealised notions of an ordered society. But if the household was intended as the primary source of order, then you could be sure that in New South Wales it was also the primary site of disorder. On his arrival at the settlement in 1814, Commandant Thompson was genuinely puzzled by the remarkable intoxication of its inhabitants, given the structures of strict surveillance prevailing at the port. Having only just arrived, he did not for a moment doubt the efficacy of those structures and instead speculated that blame must surely lie in another interesting direction. Thus we learn that the irregular still operated by the prisoner John Moss and his free wife Elizabeth was productive of much drunkenness and riot. Not surprisingly, he also remarks, Moss was fined here for a like offence. The free wife of a convict constable, <coughs> Martha Young, also took an entrepreneurial approach to her circumstances and her hut. She conducted herself extremely ill by keeping a disorderly house and fermenting quarrels among the constables and soldiers. There has to be Hogarth, and this is the closest I could get to a disorderly house. Women like Martha Young and Elizabeth Moss remind us that not every woman who landed at Newcastle was under sentence, although they probably soon would be. In 1815, it became apparent that a very busy, busy passenger service had developed on the coastal vessels, government as well as private. Men, but especially women, darted between Sydney and Newcastle under pass pleading urgent business or under the pretext of visiting friends and relations. But as Commandant Thompson belatedly observed, in reality for the purpose of carrying on clandestine traffic. And everyone was implicated, including Mrs Evans, the doctor's wife. Even when free movement was subsequently restricted and the pass system curtailed, the enterprising invariably found a way to operate unhindered. Later the same year, we learn that a free woman, again named Maria, was sent to Newcastle for adulterous behaviour at the behest of her free husband, Foster, who worked as a carpenter on the Elizabeth. Although, as Wallace dryly observed, they now appear perfectly reconciled. <laughs> she was, in fact, carefully positioned to fulfil the time-honoured female role of receiving goods for and from her husband. Thus, women were often the means by which goods passed out of the settlement and by which payment, usually in the form of spirits, was distributed within it. It was a form of mobility that would be comprehensively shut down as the penal stations were moved north. The convicts in Newcastle were engaged in a complex juggling act, but it was one for which they were well trained by the common experience of plebeian life. They were familiar with patterns of exchange that were regulated less by currency and more by the movement of material goods. Equally, they were adept at the practices, the perks and lurks that maintained a healthy supply of those goods. A vibrant black economy allowed prisoners with the necessary wherewithal to obviate some of the hardships of penal station life, to supplement their rations, to gain comfort from the bottle, and even to accumulate property. However, its operation required effort, success on the black market, meant a life lived on wits and stolen opportunities. It also involved a degree of intra-convict theft, which meant greater hardship for the more vulnerable of the settlement. Moreover, this material subculture was never an exclusively convict domain. The terms were set by the traders of the coastal vessels and the convict office holders. And if the market was threatened, it was ordinary convicts who suffered. Thus, in 1818, when Macquarie, Macquarie launched what he hoped would be a final assault on the illicit coastal trade, Wallace warned him, that a total prohibition on all but government goods would deprive the prisoners of the little indulgences compatible with their situation. And more seriously, he intimated that discontented sailors would retaliate by refusing to bring the prisoners' letters. Class commonality and social accommodation had its limits. Moreover, Morissette's anxieties throughout 1820 concerning the activities of the boatmen and in particular the intimate connections between the master of the Mary Ann, the chief constable, the chief clerk and the pilot reveal that whatever Macquarie's intentions in 1818 and 1820, the structure of the black economy 
were as buoyant as ever. In part, life at Newcastle was an echo, or rather an extension of the struggle born out of the transformation of customary rights into legal wrongs. Equally, it was an echo of traditional attitudes to what constituted crime. The convicts and sailors would no doubt have endorsed George Crabbe's poem of smugglers and poachers. What guilt is his? Who pays for what he buys? Indeed, plebeian networks of exchange and the many forms of unregulated labour, ranging from the licit to the illicit, are far better understood on a continuum rather than as a discrete category on either side of the door. In 1992, Paula Jane Byrne wrote, and it's the last page, the town culture of Sydney arose from the artificial structures of an economy tied to the convict system and the competition of a port. This was no less true of Sydney's closest trading partner and neighbour, the Newcastle Penal Station. Life on the settlement was shaped by the attitudes, beliefs and habits stowed in the transported and migratory baggage of the convicts, seamen and soldiers. But it was also shaped by its proximity to the sea, with all those ambiguous possibilities of comfort, grief, wealth and knowledge. It was the circumstances of the port that created the ideal conditions for the convicts, sailors and soldiers to replicate the black trading patterns of the old world and to construct their community here in the newest one. Above all, the sea remained the enduring focus for dreams of freedom for the inhabitants of a settlement that was quite literally caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. And it is as well to remember that before we embark on our own archival voyage to discover those lost lives, we must first gaze at Abel Tasman's as yet unimagined island and cross the vivid Terrazzo Ocean, the sea dreaming underfoot at the Mitchell Library. Thank you, Tamsin. That was a fabulous presentation. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, any questions? Yes, down the back. You've located the pirates and the smugglers within the convict subculture, which suggests that there were no what we might call freebooters, a la the illustration. No, well, no, uh, sorry. But I grew up in a part of Newcastle, which was always known as Pirate Point. And I'm wondering. I didn't actually, that was one of the little bits I had to drop to stay in my um, 45 minute. But um, Pirate's Point was named in precisely the sort of the circumstances that I've described. I think it was 1800 or 1801, I can't remember. Um, people escaping from Port Jackson, 1801. They uh, were wrecked at the point that is now known as Pirate's Point. No, they were, it wasn't a it wasn't a black beard's den. There's um, actually in New South Wales, there's absolutely nothing that resembles Caribbean pirates. In, in, yeah, I, 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 um, I hate to disappoint you, but there isn't. There's no doubloons. There's no secret islands and black spots. But um, in Western Australia, there is a pirate, yeah, a black pirate actually, who was leading something approximating that sort of life in the 1820s. Yeah. Um, you wanted to talk. Have you connected your studies here in the Newcastle, primary Newcastle area, with the hinterland settlements? Uh, yes. At the very beginning, like maybe 12, 13. Yes, indeed. How, how do you embrace that in your story? Well, I've, I've, in terms of, you know, you have to make some kind of structure when you're writing a thesis. So I had to make a decision that I couldn't incorporate those themes in this particular um, piece, but they come into the next piece. I hint at it when I mention Broken Bay, because, of course, that's the escape route to the Hawkesbury. So the Hawkesbury settlers are absolutely fundamental. But what's, and some people get to the Hawkesbury by sea, but mostly they get there by land. And that's the, the subject of my next chapter, because I want to look at that expansionism of the settlement into the bush, upriver, the connection with Hawkesbury, the creation of infrastructure, the devastation for the indigenous population, and so on. That's another area. And in the upper 
look, I won't. I don't think I'll be. Well, if, if, the, if the bush rangers get that far, then I'll be looking at them. But it, so that the, my concern is people from the settlement and how that relates back to the penal station, because that you know the penal station is actually the, the subject that I'm looking at. Yes, and then moving up to Port Macquarie and Moreton Bay. Yeah. Any other questions for Tamsin? Nancy? Hello, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. It's so wonderful to see someone looking at our history <laughs> in, a, in a different and fresh way. And, and that um, the tracking all the movement between Newcastle and Sydney was what I wanted for me. I, I did imagine the settlement to be much more isolated. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, but my, my question goes right back to your introduction. Which, uh, where you were reflecting on the way that Australians have imagined themselves as people of the dry interior and not of the coast. And, and I think it, I mean, it's almost a rough shift that happens around the start of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I was studying beach culture, and, and the beach culture people I think, uh, came up with this idea of a veranda culture. So we like the sense of enclosure, but looking out to the sea, let's say, on land. But I also wondered if you thought there was a, a difference in the literature that comes out of Melbourne, the Melbourne School, and the Sydney School in this sense. Because it, another description that I've heard is that Melbourne sits with its back to the ocean, looking into the interior, yes. and they're much more connected, whereas Sydney was always a more outward looking Sydney, a city. And, and so, does it potentially, uh, what you're tracking with geography, potentially reflect the strength of? History in Melbourne. Look, I think it might. And, the national narrative. and possibly not not just history, but, but cultural artifacts. It's the Heidelberg School mm. and um, those sorts. I grew up, my parents are Australian, despite the fact I sound like I arrived last Thursday, I know. But, um, and so I, I grew up with expatriate parents and I was swamped with bush, of, uh, bush artifacts every Christmas and birthday. <laughs> You know, Banjo Patterson, Henry Lawson, Bush Christmas. Oh, we had the lot. And every calendar, every year. But so that sense of it was really impressed upon me. And then when I finally got back to Australia, to my parents' home, I was devastated. It was Brisbane, it was tropical. <laughs> it didn't resemble my imaginings at all. But um, I think there is a difference, but not that great a difference, because Melbourne, yes, it's inward looking, it's the cultural heart. But Sydney is so focused on that movement of going through the Blue Mountains, which that draws their gaze inwards as well. And then the outward gaze is a recreational one. And that I think I just tried to touch on that because that's what Frank Bro Breeze or Bros um, does in his book. He points out that there's a strong culture of the beach, but that it isn't connected to our working life in you know it's that it's all about squatters it's all about um, bushmen never wharfies or pirates do mm -hmm. you think that also comes from the um, the free settlement pride that like a lot of free settlers went inland oh I'm, I'm sure that I mean yeah, it all starts at the ocean but in the end it's all about land yeah. but it, I mean it's also about possession it's about expansionism, it's about claiming the continent, claiming the land. And in order to do that, you've got to move away from the coast. So I think those ideas are all um, layered in it. And I think you know, people have been working on it far more insightfully than myself for a long time about the bush legend. Um, although I still I find Russell Ward's work very appealing. I like to go back to it and, and sort of think about it again. Linda. Thank you, wonderful paper. I think uh, this idea about the, the coast and the maritime history versus the inland, and it's very, it, it's great that you have reminded us that that uh, first you know, 30 or 40 years of, um, of occupation, I guess, rather than settlement, is about, is a very maritime experience, yes. and that you're speaking about there were various goods that were sought not only by the convicts but by others in this informal trade and of course part of that trade is coming from New Zealand and yeah. other places in the yeah. Pacific. And India even. And India yeah. is sort of, that, that's really where 
the interest lies. It's timber coming from uh, New Zealand and they're growing potatoes and it's establishing a mm. kind of maritime existence, which is very much what Sydney and probably Van Diemen's Land will about. Yes, yes. It's much more obvious in Van Diemen's Land, but I was worrying about my introduction actually over the last few days because I'm walking around Newcastle and thinking, well, blind Freddy can see. This is obvious to everyone. Why am I even saying it? Because in Newcastle, it, it's just so apparent the working port is absolutely yes. there. Yes. And for those of us in Brisbane and Sydney, yes. um, you are divorced from that working yes. maritime environment. Yes. Which yes, is. That's very true. Yeah. And, very, and the same in Tasmania Yes, 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 actually. Yes. But they're sort of, they do a little bit more. I mean, it, of course, I, I, Lady Nelson, which came up here, everybody claims the Lady Nelson, but she, the replica, of course, is in Hobart. Um, but she was very active here. And the Yes, and the exactly. Yes, indeed. Oh, sorry, Vicky, Vicky, and then up the back here, and then we'll have to turn around. Um, this is kind of a, um, I'm not quite sure I have framed this question. I don't really know very much about this area they talked about, but I've always been intrigued by the Marines and their, the way that, you know, they went on strike before they left Thames and they were kind of unruly when they got here. How do the Marines and the sailors and the convicts um, fit in? Is there any, like, are the sailors and the Marines quite different or is there... Back there is, yes, they are different. And I think, I think all of these groups, and I, I'm, I'm actually speaking in a guessy way about this, I don't feel I can answer it somebody like Peter Stanley would be able to answer it much better than me, but um, these organisations are all very tribal mm. and, um, you know, a regiment and, uh, and sailors it's all about the ship and the convicts actually formed their own tribal associations with their ship of arrival. Yeah. Um, so I think that they were divided but there was been constant interactions, at, particularly at, at Sydney, not here in Newcastle. But that all changed because the Marines went quite early on yeah. um, the, and that whole New South Wales court phase was slightly disastrous something under a yeah. 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 well that's right they, they left with their pockets lined and actually yeah. something that I also had to extricate from this um, is that in all this smuggling the officers were as guilty mm. as, Absolutely. as yeah. the oh, convicts yeah. Absolutely. And um, so I'm going to actually move that into my next chapter because what they're so focused on is timber. And, you know, Macquarie's chest in itself, well, of course that wasn't smuggled per se, but they were all after making gorgeous bits of furniture for their drawing rooms <laughs> and slipping bits of timber in and out, you know. So if the convicts took a bit, good luck on them. Okay. So just last question here. Again, in the comparison, in comparing the convict subculture and the officers who were complicit. I'm just wondering if then you're covering the larger scale smuggling networks, which would have been involving the traders who made fortunes out of commerce between Hobby um, Bay, China, India, and so on. I'm, not, doing lots of smuggling going on. I'm sure, but that's not my piece, that's not my area. Um, I think if you're wanting to find more out about that, possibly a good place to start would be David Day's book on customs history mm -hmm. of, Custom. yes, I think he's probably got that well covered. Thank you. Pleasure. Okay, well I'm sure Tamsin will be happy to answer more questions over coffee. <coughs> so if you'll just thank uh, you uh, yeah, join time. me in thanking Tamsin again for coming down. And <laughs>